We're going to talk about struct types, so here we go. Remember what I told you, Go is not, Go could be an object-oriented programming language that has aspects of it, but we want to do that. And so Go is really about struct types. It's all about data, data-oriented design. This is what I need us to start thinking about. And data really begins. Concrete data really defines ourselves around these struct types, okay? And again, this is not novel. You've had these, you have the ability to create user-defined types in every programming language you've ever used. Here we are again. I got a type here named type, named example of type. It's a struct type. When you see struct types, I want you to think concrete data. Concrete data. Concrete, something you put in your hand because everything you do is what? Data driven. Every problem you solve is driven by the data. If you don't understand the data, you don't understand the problem. And data is concrete. And the struct type gives us the ability to define that concrete data. We can call it a composite type because it's made up of many different types, existing types, right? Again, nothing novel here. Bool, N16, O32, no big deal. I have to teach you this. You got it. But I care about cost, don't I? I'm about, I'm a cost guy. So here it is. Here's the question. How many bytes of allocation does it take to create a value of type example? Who can give me that? How many bytes of allocation do we have the cost of when I create a value like I'm doing here on line 20? Seven. seven. Okay. I like the answer seven. Seven makes sense because all of you did the following. You said, okay, Bill, I got you here. We've got a pool, Bill. One byte. Bill, we're going to add 16. Two bytes. And Bill, you know, i got a float. 32. That's four bytes. One, two, four. That's seven. I love what you did. You're all wrong, but I love what you did. It's not your fault. The reality is the programming languages you've been using has hid this away from you. Thank God. Go is doing it as well. But there's not going to be seven bytes of allocation here. It's going to be eight. Uh, now, I'm only bringing this up because I want you to understand the cost. Now, there's something called alignments. And the hardware dictates alignments to us. Really, alignments are about efficiency in the hardware, right? Efficiency. The basic unit of, of that memory is that word size, okay? When we start really getting deep down into, into that base memory there, okay, that hardware is gonna be reading and writing those, that word size, let's say eight bytes at a time. And so what happens is, is every word there is, an, is, a, is a cost, it's an operation. So alignments say, let's make sure the data is properly aligned within these word boundaries so there's efficiency. What does that mean? Well, imagine this. Imagine I had these two word boundaries. There they are, two word boundaries. And I'm working on a two-byte integer. And I lay that two-byte integer across these two boundaries. How silly is that? A two-byte integer can easily fit inside of any given word boundary. But now that I've done this, now that I've misaligned this memory, in order to read and write, I have to do how many operations? Two. And God forbid I'm writing at the same time I'm reading with the latency of the two operations. You can just give up now. So. The hardware says, I need you to align memory so I can be efficient in reading and writing. And I don't want to deal with it, though there's hardware that can handle, can, can handle this. And the compiler said, OK, no problem. I'll take care of it. So thank god the compiler deals with all alignments. And all memory is aligned. This is not just here. This is the first time you're seeing it because alignments happen at the field level, too, because you've got data types. So here's the rule. Here's the rule for alignments. It's really not that complicated, okay? If you're dealing with a one byte value, one byte value, that can fit in any word, right? Without any issues. You can't cross a boundary with one byte. One byte can be anywhere. But a two byte, a two, a two byte value, that in 16, if we misalign it, we're gonna end up here. No, 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 no. So what are we gonna do? Right. Every two byte value needs to fall on a two byte. Alignment. In other words, if we look at the last digit, the last digit of any address should never be random. If we're going to fall on a two-byte alignment, that means that the last digit of any address should end in 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, hexadecimal numbers, 8, 8, she said 8, B, C, got it. 
two byte value, two byte alignment. What about a four byte value? Four byte alignment, zero, four, eight, C. Okay? Eight byte values, eight byte alignments, zero, eight, zero, eight, zero, eight. We can look at the last digit of any integer and know exactly what it should be within, within, that, within that range. Now, there's one more rule for structs. And Go says, okay, the entire struct value should fall on an alignment based on the largest field. So this struct has to also land on a four byte boundary, with the full value. So if you walk this now, you're going to see the following. The bool can be anywhere, correct? Let's say it's at address zero. The two byte integer, that can't be anywhere. That has to fall on what? A two byte alignment. That's going to end up on two. What happened to the byte at address one? Padding. Love that word. Yes. That's the padding byte. It gets skipped over because of the alignment. And now we know this falls on four. So the one byte of padding is in between those two fields. Wow, we understand cost. So this gets interesting. Now, how many bytes of padding do we have between the bool and count? Three. Yeah, because that second field has to fall on a four byte. Ah, you get it. If I make it 64, seven. Ah, padding bytes. Now, as a micro-optimization, let's say that you did a memory profile. You're using a lot of memory. One way we could reduce memory is by making sure that we reduce padding. One way to reduce padding is to order fields from largest to smallest. Now, I promise you this. If I do a code review and I see a struct that's ordered from largest to smallest, you and I are going to take a walk. Because now you're optimizing for performance and not readability. And until you have a memory profile that suggests that padding is hurting you, and you better write a big note that starts with, Bill, I ran a memory profile, and trust me, we need this optimization. I am not teaching you this so you run back into your code and start reordering structs. No, fields should be ordered in a logical, readable order. But it's one way of reducing some memory consumption. You've got programs dealing with very large amounts of things, and you absolutely need it. I'm teaching you this because I want you to understand cost. And understanding cost understands allocation. Right? Now you can read any struct, and you got it. But remember, again, if there was an 8 byte field here, then the, the, the entire struct still has to be aligned on an 8 byte, and there could be always some padding at the bottom. Okay? Again, all this padding and these things are all for efficiencies. Efficiencies, right? We'll take the cost of a little extra memory for the, the efficiency. Yeah, remember, engineering is all about what? What cost you're going to take for what gain you need. Okay, great. All right, I think we got enough there.